Praise the Lord. And welcome to Last Days Church in the city of Nashville, Tennessee, where yours truly is the pastor, Pastor T.W. Bell. Certainly this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing, and we're glad in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. We bless God this morning for another privilege, another opportunity to be able to come together to share with you out of the word of God in Jesus' name. And we bless God in Jesus' name. And so I pray that even as the intro was saying that you're ready to clap, that you're ready to laugh, that you're ready to worship, that you're ready to go deeper into the mind of God. And so we bless God this morning in Jesus' name for you being with us in Jesus' name. So you know what time it is. Gather your family, send somebody a text, send somebody an email, send somebody a link, let them know that last day's church is on and that Pastor Bell is getting ready to deliver a rhyme of word. Amen. In Jesus' name. So we bless God in Jesus' name. Amen. Get the family together. Amen. Cut the TV off. You can look at that later. Amen. Cut that off. You can listen to that later. Amen. This is a word that's going to impact your life, alter your life, and possibly change change the course of your life. And so we just bless God in Jesus name for the platform that God has given us to be able to minister and to speak into the lives of his people in Jesus name. And so this morning in Jesus name, we bless God and we are going to prepare to turn our hearts towards prayer. Amen. And the Bible declares that men ought to always pray and not to faint. And we have so many things to pray for. We have so much to pray for. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. And even though, yes, there's a vaccination and people are beginning to relax, I want to tell the saints, don't let your guard down. Amen. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. And so we need to pray, amen, for those that are recovering, those that's been affected. Amen. We need to pray for the families of those that have lost someone due to COVID. Amen. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for the first responders, for the doctors, for the nurses, for the firemen, for all of those, amen, that are in the midst of the fight with us. We need to pray for President Biden as he, amen, tries to navigate through these uh, uncharted waters. We need to pray for him, that the Lord would uh, bless him and strengthen him. We need to pray for our political climate, for our racial climate, for our economic climate, amen, for our social climate. There are so many things to pray for. It's alarming that over half a million people in this country have lost their lives, amen, due, due to coronavirus. And so this morning in Jesus' name, amen, I'm going to touch and agree with you for your miracle, for your healing, for your strength. I'm going to touch and agree with you for the doors to be open and for God to move and to make himself manifest in your life. Amen. We're praying for those that are far off, that God would draw them with loving kindness and with tender mercy. Praying for the prodigal sons and the prodigal daughters, that they would come to themselves and come back home and, and look again. And We're praying for Jonah, who's who's being held in something right now until he was submitting to God's will. And so we, do, we have a lot to pray for. We have a lot to pray for. I want you to touch and agree with me that God would bring to pass those things that are in my heart, those things that are in my spirit, for my family, in Jesus' name. We just want to pray. We want to believe God right now that God would move in a special way in Jesus' name. And so, in Jesus' name, I, I want to send out a special prayer in Jesus' name to the, for the McCray family. I want to send out a special prayer for them. They've had a lot of death in their family in the last few years, the last few months, should I say. And so we just want to pray that God would comfort them, that God would strengthen them in a special way uh, in Jesus' name. I have a friend, a brother in the Lord that I uh, used to work with, and he, he's a brother as always, uh, Ed. And I want to pray for his family in Jesus' name in their loss, in this hour of bereavement, that God would just comfort them, strengthen them. And be with them in Jesus' name. And so we believe in God. We believe in, amen, that God is going to touch, that God is going to bless, and that God is going to strengthen. And the Bible declares this, that he is a very present help in the time of trouble. So no matter what trouble you're dealing with, God can be found this morning in Jesus' name. And so with that said and done, please stretch out your hand, gather your loved ones, and draw a little closer in Jesus' name. And and we are going to go before the throne of grace this morning in Jesus' name. And I want to say that, that, that I want to ask the question, and I'm going to answer it, is anything too hard for God? And the, the, the answer is no. God can do anything but fail. 
Amen. He's supernatural and naturally super. There is nothing that is beyond the reach of his hand. God can do it. God can do it. God can do it. I know it may seem hard, but God can do it. Amen. God can do it. If you have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed. Amen. All you need, all you need is a little bit of faith. All you need is a little bit of belief. Amen. And you can watch God work. In Jesus' name on your behalf. So, Father, now, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you, God, we thank you this morning. We love you this morning. We bless you this morning. We honor you this morning. We lift you up. We magnify you. We exalt you, oh God, in Jesus' name. And God, this morning, we are ready to worship. We are ready to give you glory. We are ready to give you honor. We are ready to give you praise, God. Hallelujah, God. So, God, this morning, in the name of Jesus, we set the atmosphere, we set the platform, we set the stage, and we invite invite you to come in. We invite you in Jesus' name to show up. We invite you to move, to touch, to bless, to strengthen, to encourage. We invite you, God, to deposit into us, our God, your purpose, your joy, your strength, your peace, oh God, in the wonderful name of Jesus. And God, this morning, in Jesus' name, as we come, hallelujah, God, we thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for every door that you've opened. We thank you for every way that you've made. We thank you, in Jesus' name, for every time that you showed up and you showed out. We thank you for sustaining us and for suspending us. We thank you for supplying our needs according to your riches and your glory. We thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We thank you for being our healer our doctor. We thank you for being a friend that stick up closer than a brother. We thank you this morning in Jesus' name for each and everything that you have done. And God, right now, in Jesus' name, we come together collectively with one heart, with one mind, with one soul. And that is one purpose, to lift you up, to glorify you, to honor you, and to bless your holy name. And so, God, now, in the name of Jesus, we beseech your mercy. We beseech your grace. We beseech your favor. We beseech you, oh God, in Jesus' name, that God, in Jesus' name, you would strengthen somebody right now that's been depleted, that you would encourage somebody right now that needs encouragement, that you would motivate somebody whose head is hung down, oh God. Do it, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We, we ask you to touch the family that's in the morning stages now, God, because they've dealt with bereavement. They lost a loved one. They lost a child. Or they lost a spouse, oh God. Hallelujah. Just be with them in the name of Jesus. We understand that you are the God of comfort, God. So send comfort, oh God, that only you can give, oh God. Do it right now in the name of Jesus. We ask you to stretch out your hand. And we ask you, God, in Jesus' name, that we might be able to feel your presence as you caress us, oh God, in Jesus' name, with your love, God. Do it right now. Strengthen right now. Encourage right now. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we ask for all of the families that are dealing with COVID, that are recovering. We ask for those that have lost loved ones. We ask for those that have been vaccinated. God, that there would be victory in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, right now, in Jesus' name, you said that at your name, every knee has to bow. So, God, according to your word, we speak the name of Jesus over every corona patient. We speak the name of Jesus over everyone in Jesus' name that's been infected and affected by corona. We ask you now, God, that your glory would be revealed, your power would be made manifest. And God, now, in Jesus' name, we lift up the leaders of our country, the leaders of our world. We lift up the president, the prime minister, the king, the queen. We lift them up, governors, and our God, right now, mayors in Jesus' name, and those that are sitting in the places of authority. Father, now, we lift them up, our God, according to your word, God, that we might live a quiet and a peaceable life. Give them wisdom and strengthen them even now. And God, we ask you to stretch out your hand and remember the families that don't have adequate resources, the families whose resources have run out and the families whose resources are stretched 
then, oh God, make a way, supply every need, do it, oh God, in the wonderful name of Jesus. And oh God, hallelujah, 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 this morning in Jesus' name, we ask you to come in and regulate. We ask you in Jesus' name to touch our hearts, to touch our minds, to touch our spirit, to touch our soul, to let your glory be revealed, oh God, in the wonderful name of Jesus. And God, I ask you today, Dry the tears of that person that's been crying and give them a reason to lift their eyes unto the hills because their help come from you, which made the heavens and the earth. We love you this morning. We praise you this morning and we bless you. I ask you now for every pastor that's ministering. I ask you now for every God minister that's sending forth your word, God. Right now, anoint them, God, and cause them to articulate your thought. Cause your word to have free course. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we love you today. We praise you today. We bless you today. In Jesus' name, for those that are sick, for those that are shut in, we believe healing. We believe deliverance. We believe that a way is being made right now. We thank you, and we do love you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen and amen. Come on, somebody loose those hands and bless the Lord. Somebody loose those hands and lift him up. Come on, somebody, magnify his name. Oh, God, you ought to say something. You ought to lift your hands and say thank you. You ought to bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. You ought to worship him. Hallelujah. You say, well, he hasn't done anything. Baby, you living. You breathing. You can hear me. You can see me. I, you are in the land of the living. For that, God deserves a praise. For that, God deserves glory. He deserves worship. He deserves honor. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to break their alabaster box. Somebody ought to stir up what's in them on the inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God. Somebody, hallelujah, ought to recognize that God is worthy to be praised, worthy to be glorified. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. You waiting on me, but baby, I'm really waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to come on up higher. I'm waiting on you to open your mouth and bless the Lord. You say, well, he hasn't done anything. Well, hallelujah, anyhow. Give him an anyhow praise. Hallelujah. Give him a praise on credit. Give him a praise in advance. Give him a praise before you come out. Don't wait. Hallelujah. Give him a praise right now. Oh, we bless God. We bless God. We bless God. I'm just trying to agitate you. I'm just trying to stir you up. I'm just trying to get you to come on and, and get in the right frame of mind and the right frame of spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Know that God is on your side. Hallelujah. So, amen. We bless the Lord this morning in Jesus' name. And I would like to take this moment to officially welcome you, amen, to Last Days Church in the city of Nashville, Tennessee. And we bless God in Jesus' name for you being with us this morning in Jesus' name. We don't take it for granted. We don't take it lightly. Amen. We recognize and realize that there are myriad things that you could be doing. There are a myriad of other churches that you could be tuned into. But I promise you, if you stay with us, that you're going to receive something that's going to edify you, something that's going to build you up, something that's going to be encouraging to you. So we welcome you in Jesus' name to, to uh, the liberty that's found from being in God's presence. So welcome again to Last Day's Church in Jesus' name. At this time, in Jesus' name, in recognition, amen, at this time, in recognition of Black History Month, uh, we want to take a moment to recognize, amen, uh, some of the prolific inventors, amen, uh, that are part of Black History. So at this time, take this moment and uh, be attentive as we share a moment in Black History with you. Dr. Patricia Era Bath was born November 4th, 1942. She was an American ophthalmologist, inventor, humanitarian, and academic. She was the inventor of the laser cataract surgery. Her invention was called the laser FACO probe. Listen to Dr. Bath's first. She became the first woman member of the Jules Stein Eye Institute, the first woman to lead a postgraduate training program in ophthalmology, the first woman elected to the honorary staff of the UCLA Medical Center, the first African-American person to serve as a resident in ophthalmology at New York University, the first African-American woman to serve on staff as a surgeon at the UCLA Medical Center, and the first African-American woman doctor to receive a patent for a medical purpose. Dr. Bath is the holder of five patents and co-founded the nonprofit American Institute 
for the Prevention of the Blindness in Washington, D.C. Through her studies, she discovered that African Americans was twice as likely to suffer from blindness than any other patients that she had attended and eight times more likely to develop glaucoma. Her research led to her development of a community ophthalmology system, which increased the amount of eye care given to those who were unable to afford treatment. In 1981, Bath began working on her most well-known invention, the laser FICO probe, or as we know it today, cataract surgery. The device created a less painful and more precise treatment of cataracts. She received a patent for the device in 1988. Dr. Bath also holds patents in Japan, Canada, and Europe. With her invention, she was able to help restore the sight of individuals who have been blind for more than 30 years. Dr. Bath died on May 30th, 2019 in San Francisco, California. So today we salute Dr. Bath. Amen, praise the Lord. And we bless the Lord for that moment in black history. And we thank the Lord for Dr. Bab uh, in her invention in Jesus' name. It is amazing some of the things that we find out that African-Americans have created. It's a myriad of things. And as a matter of fact, there is a book that you can get. Uh, it hi highlights uh, all of the inventions, inventions of African-Americans in Jesus' name. So we bless God uh, for it being Black History Month, and we pray that uh, you enjoyed that uh, insight and that tidbit on Black History in Jesus' name. And so now, amen, we, we understand that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And right now, I want you to get your Bible and I want you to get prepared because we're getting ready to minister a preceding word, a rhema word, amen, in Jesus' name. And so this is something that we have been ministering for a moment now, and uh, we're going to try to conclude it today. Uh, and uh, I hope that it has blessed you. I hope that you are tapping into eternal purposes. I hope in Jesus' name, that your mindset is shifting and you're starting to see and understand that it's not the temporal things that I need to be concerned with, but the eternal things, the things which are not seen. Amen. I hope that you're storing up uh, in, in heaven treasures, thesaurus, riches are in heaven and not just on earth. Amen. And so this morning we are going to try uh, to bring this to a conclusion in Jesus' name. And, and, and pray with me because it's so difficult. It's so difficult when you love God and you, you love God's word and you love God's people and you want to just share with them everything that you have. But I, I'm finding out you can't minister everything that you know in 40 minutes. Amen. So pray for us and amen. I'm praying for you in Jesus' name. Amen. So with that said and done, Grab your Bibles, and we are going to go to the book of Romans, chapter number 8. And uh, we are going to look at verse number 29, and, and this is where we kind of left off at, and I'm going to try to pick up and, and uh, pick up where we left off at and then take you a little bit further and conclude in Jesus' name because, amen, amen, uh, um, there is a lot to be shared with you in Jesus' name. Romans, chapter number 8. The 29th verse, and it reads, For whom he did foreknow, prognosco, we said, he did also predestinate to be conformed, to be conformed, to be conformed, to be conformed to the image, the econ of his son, that he may, might be, the firstborn among many brethren. Let me read that again. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. And we are going to minister to you, amen, eternal purposes, part four. Eternal purposes, 
part four. And I pray by now you you have a greater grasp, a greater insight, a, a, a greater respect for the eternal purposes that God has founded in Jesus. Make no mistake, don't misconstrue it, don't misinterpret it, don't misapply it. The eternal purpose is founded in Jesus. He is a substratering factor of eternal purposes. And so we want you to understand and recognize is that there has to be a paradigm shift where I stop being so earthly minded and I stop being uh, uh, so disposed to right now that I start looking towards eternity. So that I start working on things that are going to have a greater effect in eternity. We found out that eternity is an element of time, but eternity is broader than time is. We found out that eternity operates in time, outside of time, but eternity outlasts time. We found out that from everlasting to everlasting, that God is God. And, and so whatever God does, whatever God purposes, it's going to come to pass. So if God has set his intent, if God has set his will, and we found out his bulima or his prophecies, uh, the Greek terms for purpose, if God sets purpose, if God ordains purpose, baby, it's going to come to pass. And, and I just want you to recognize and realize is that if you are ever going to become what God wants you to become or purpose for you to become, you've got to have a mind shift. You've got to have a paradigm shift. You, you've got, uh, you, you cannot be caught up in little things, minor things. You've got to start looking at the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is that God wants his purpose in you to be made manifest. And so we found out that when we first started in Jesus' name, that the purpose of God started outside of time. The Bible declared to us in the book of Ephesians before the foundation of the world that he had already chosen us and let my picked us, selected us by hand in him that we should be holy before him in love without blame. And we, we found out in Jesus' name that God was already working on eternal things before we even came into being. And so that ought to make you shout. That ought to make you worship. But we, we went a little further and we recognized and we realized that there were some purposes in Jesus, amen, that were eternal. We found out that one eternal purpose is that Jesus was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the enemy. Ah, God, somebody say it now. The devil is going to be defeated. The devil is going to be defeated. Everything that he has done, everything that he is doing, it is going to be under our feet because Jesus was made manifest to destroy his works. Oh, praise the name of our God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But we, 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 we went through a lot and we found out a lot and uh, we discovered a lot. And I hope that you're able to grasp some of the things that I shared with you. Uh, but we, we, we recognize something that when we looked at the book of Romans here, we found out in the book of Romans that one of the eternal purposes that was founded in Christ is that our oh God, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, that he might be the prototype of what is to come. And so we found out that God wants us to be conformed, made, shaped into the icon, the image of his son. And so when we look at the image of his son, and when we look at icon in its, its purest setting, it is not a mirrored reflection. It is a replication of the original. It is a duplication that has the same DNA. Oh, God. Uh, uh, God, in other words, he wants you to be just like him. He does not want you to just be a reflection, but he wants you to be a, a replication of who he is. And so as we begin to uh, take on the form and the shape, we went to the original purpose that God had. And so we, we looked in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, in the 26th and the 27th verse. And 
we found out um, that out of all the things that God made, out of all the things that God did, out of the, 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 the mountain branches, the firmament, the power, the seas, the oceans, the rivers, the streams, the flowers, and all of the intricate things that God did in creation. Oh uh, God, we found out, hallelujah, that man is the only one that was created to bear God's image. And so this brings us up to speed and this brings us to the stage and the platform that we have to work from now. So we recognize and realize that what is man that thou art so mindful of him and the son of man that God visited man. It is because man, as I said, is the centerpiece of God's our creation. Our God, he is the one that after he made everything and said that it was good, it was not until he set man in the middle of the garden that he said that it was very good. Our God in Jesus' name. So now, hallelujah, I said this, that man is the one who is to bear the image of God. Man is the one who is to be the econ, the replication of who God is. And so God sets man in a setting that he might be able to reproduce the essence of who God said he could be. Ah, God, I wish somebody would understand there is more to you than meets the eye. I wish somebody would recognize and realize that you are in a place of dominion. Ah, God, because I said that when Adam woke up, nobody had to tell him that he had dominion. It was something innately in him that made him recognize that everything is under my feet. When you become a born-again believer, when you become a blood-washed, Holy Ghost, tongue-talking believer, you start to recognize, or you should recognize, that things are under your feet. You should stand in a position of authority. You should walk in a place of authority. That's why Ah, uh, God, when you start to recognize who you are, that's why the enemy comes against you with everything that he has, because he doesn't want you to portray and to project the image of God. That's why he fights you tooth and nail, trying to defeat you, trying to distract you. Ah, but somebody ought to let the devil know that you are up under my feet, that I am not ignorant of your devices. Oh, God, that you will not get the advantage over me because I stand in the place as God. I stand in the image of God. I am a replication of who he is. I have authority. I said that God Adam begin to name things as God begin to bring them to him. I don't know about you, but I'm naming victory for my house. I'm naming breakthrough for my family. I'm naming a miracle. Ah, God, today, ah, I wish I had a witness in this house that would name some stuff. Ah, God, hallelujah. So I had him recognizes that he is in a place of dominion and that he is in a place of authority. And so, ah, God, now, 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 I don't want you to get caught up and get so uh, sidetracked on the physical part of the image. Don't get me wrong. Ah, God, the Bible declares that we was made in his image, but I ah, got somebody wants to get into what color was his eyes? It was, was his hair locky or was his hair long? That's not in important. The image is a man because Adam represents humanity. Adam represents mankind. He represents the totality of humanity. Ah, and so God is interested in the totality of the image in humanity. Ah, God, not just in ethnicity. Ah, God. So as we begin to understand, and don't get me wrong, we have to be ethnically aware. We have to be ethnically conscient. And the reason I say that 
is because, how God, even though we are all the same, there are eth ethical traits and there are ethical things that show up through our cultures that may be a little bit different. And this is why we have to have an open mind because if we don't have an open mind, we won't be able to appreciate the diversity that's found in humanity. Oh, praise the name of our God. Uh, ah, God, hallelujah. So let's move a little bit further. So now, 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 man is created in God's image. He is created in God's likeness. Mm. And so Genesis tells us that. Ah, oh my God, but I got to share some, something with you so that you begin to get a greater understanding of it. Because now, 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 through time, through the fall, ah, God, it has hindered or slowed down the process. But let me tell you something. Just because something has been slowed down or hindered don't mean that it ain't going to happen. Can I tell you this, that what God purposed, ah, God, it's going to come to pass, that what God intended is going to be made manifest. He intended for man to bear his image. He intended for man to project his image. And, and everything that the devil has done to try to stop us, everything that the enemy has done, eh, God, to try to hold us back, it has not worked. Oh, my God, everything that the devil did to you, I God to hold you in bondage and I God to make you think that you was less than. It's all been a lie. But the scales are falling off your eyes now. You're starting to understand that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You're starting to see how God, hallelujah, that your word is not in the external picture that people can observe. That your worth is on the inside. Ah, my God, because that's where the image has to be developed at first. You cannot develop the image and the character of God from the outside. It has to be developed from the inside. And that's why you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Because whenever you get the Spirit of God, it's the quintessential essence of who God is. Ah, my God. It is God in concentrated form. The Holy Ghost of ah, God is a double dose of God in the Spirit being made manifest in you. And what it does is it begins to create the image of God on the inside. Ah, my God. So from the inside out, God begins to develop his image in you. And that's why the songwriter said there's something on the inside. Ah, God. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in me. I, God, hey, I feel the Holy Ghost. God wants to bring about a change in you. God wants to do a new thing in you. God wants to create a new image in you. I, God, you say, I've been like this all my life. That's the problem. And you're trying to hold on to what God is trying to take you away from. Ah, God, let me hit you with a word. If any man be in Christ, ah, God, he is a new catechist. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. God want to take you to some new places. God want to give you some new experiences. God, hallelujah, want to do some new things in your life. And I hear the word of God saying, remember not the form of things of old. Behold, God says, I'll do a new thing. Mm, ah, God, somebody ought to throw their hands up and get ready because there's a river getting ready to come up in your dry plate. Somebody ought to throw their hands up and bless God because God is getting ready to come to your wilderness and do a new thing. So the image of God has to be created inside of you. And, and as it's created inside, it changes you from the inside out. And so, I want to share something with you out of the Word of God. That even as the natural man represented the image, the spiritual man has to represent the image as well. I, I'm going to share something with you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And now, contextually, 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks to us about the glory of the resurrection. And somebody said, if by any means I might obtain to the resurrection, I don't care what I got to go through. I don't care what I got to deal with. I don't care who I got to walk away from. I want to get to the place that I'm resurrection and rapture ready. Oh, yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. If, if, if you're not resurrection and rapture ready, you, you're wasting your time. If you're not resurrection and rapture ready, you don't need to be focused on nothing else but getting resurrection and rapture ready. By any means, whatever you got to do, you got to get there. Hallelujah. But Reverend, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks to us about the resurrection. And so I have to be contextual with you and tell you the truth that is contextually found in the scripture. But then there is an eternal purpose and there is an eternal truth that is applicable that we can glean from 1 Corinthians 15. Look what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. He's talked to us about the different dimensions of glory and how there's different glories to different bodies. But he says this, verse 45, and so, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And you know what the Bible says, that God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. And I want to tell you something. The only way you can live is that God has to constantly breathe in you. Mm. Ah, God, I wish I had a witness in this house. Some people trying to live outside the breath of God. I don't want to live without God's breath. That's called existing. But he came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Somebody say, breathe on me, God. Breathe in me. Breathe through me, God. Mm. Hallelujah. So he says, as it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. But then it gets deeper. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. What do you mean, the last man, Adam? The last man, Adam, was made a Zorro Pereiro, a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. Through the breath of God, the first man, Adam, got life and began to live naturally. But through the second man, Adam, we get spiritual life and we begin to live spiritually. Oh, God. Now look at this. He says, verse 46, how be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Mm. So verse 46 just lets you know the spirit didn't come first. It was the natural dimension of the image that came first. But now let's take it further. Verse 47, and he says this, for the first man is of the earth, earthly. And you can't be caught with a first man mind. Where What I mean is that you only think earthly. That's the problem with too many people. And that's why they never fulfill their destiny because they only think earthly. They only trying to get ahead in this life. They only want to make some money, only want another blessing, only want another way made. But you just can't think earthly, you got to start thinking spiritually. Listen to this. For the first man is of the earth earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So don't get it twisted. The second Adam is the Lord Jesus Christ. The second Adam is the spiritual image. The second Adam Amen. Brings another dimension of life to us that extends beyond the natural. So he says this, verse 48, as is the earthly, such, they, such are they also that are earthly. Listen now. And as is the heavenly, such are they also 
that are heaven. So what he's saying is we're going to bear the image of both. What he's saying is the eternal purpose, the fulfillment of it, is that the image of God is made manifest and that it's seen. And the only way it can be seen is that it has to be manifest spiritually from the natural body. Mm. So verse 49, he says this, And as we have borne the image, the econ, remember, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now here again, contextually, he is talking about the resurrection, but there is an eternal truth there and there's an eternal purpose there is that we bear the image of God, which we were originally created to bear in the first place. It's natural and it's spiritual. So, 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 now let's, let's move because God uses several vehicles to, to do this, to change us. He uses several vehicles that we might be able to bear that image. Number one, God uses his word to clean us up. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways, but by taking heed to the word of God. And so we take heed to the word of God and it begins to clean us up naturally and spiritually, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. The word of God begins to restructure us. And this is why the Bible tells us that we have to have our mind renewed with the word. We have to have our hearts renewed with the word. Amen. 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 And then he, he takes us further. I want to take you somewhere. So now, 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 how is he going to do this? He's going to use the word to do it, but more so, he's going to use the spirit of God to do it. And so as we look, let's go to 2 Corinthians. And, and I love this scripture, but it, it shared something, it shared something with me that made me want to shout, that made me want to dance, that made me want to, amen, give God praise. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. And you're going to find it. And you know it already. It's the 17th verse. He says, Now, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You see, some people are bound because they stay in circles that don't allow the spirit of God to move. Mm. Say, God, some people stay messed up because they only run in circles where the spirit of God isn't moving. I don't want to be anywhere where God's spirit is at. I don't want to belong to a church that won't let the Holy Ghost have his way. Mm, God, hey, hey, yeah, 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 thank you. I don't want to be a part of a ministry that won't let the Holy Ghost come in and wash me when I need to be washed. Won't let the Holy Ghost caress me when I need to be caressed. Because the Holy Ghost, hey amen, knows what to do when you don't know that I have a problem. Hmm. The Holy Ghost makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God, according to the purpose of God. Eh? Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost, sometimes you start to pray and it takes over. And now, hey, God, the only reason it's taking over that it's trying to pray you into God's purpose. It's trying to pray you into what God's will is. Mm. That's why you ought to pray in the Holy Ghost and build yourself up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says this. Now the Lord is that spirit, 3 and 17. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But it's more than liberty. Look at what happens. Because you are never going to become the manifestation of God's image and the projection of his image while you're in bondage. Mm. See, the Lord cannot clearly project his image through people that are bound. And this is why Jesus came to set us free. And if the Son sets you free, mm, 
You free indeed. I wish I had a witness that I throw their hand up that God can set you free from addiction, that God can set you free from proclivity, that God can set you free from the scar. Ah, God, where somebody violated you. God can set you free from it because he cannot project his image in you as long as you are bound. And when he frees you, you got to do what the Bible says. Uh, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke, the zugos of bondage. Delia, God doesn't want you to be a slave. God doesn't want you to be bound. God doesn't want you to be tangled up. He wants you to be in liberty. He wants you to be free. And as you free, you begin to look and see what freed you. Look at this. Verse 18. He says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, a mirror, we see the glory of the Lord. Mm. Show me your glory, God. I'm like Moses. I, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. And even if it means showing me your hinder part, that's all right. Show me your glory, God. Because the back of God's glory is just as powerful as the front. Mm. We beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, verse 18, look, are changed mm, into the same image from glory to glory. Oh God, somebody say, I'm going through a change. I'm going through a change. I'm going through a change. God is changing me. God is showing me his glory and what I see I want to be. God is showing me his glory and what I see I want to become. Just like he did Moses. When he showed Moses his glory, Moses, the glory rubbed off on Moses and Moses became what he seen. This is why it's important for us as parents, as leaders, as teachers, as preachers, as evangelists, that we got to show people the right example of God's image, the right example example of God's glory because as we show them they want to become what they see that is the nature of a child that's why children are fascinated with their daddy that's why the girls are fascinated with their mother they want to put on their mother's shoes and walk around the house in their mother high heel shoes because they see mama walking in them shoes and so God wants to show you his glory show you his power show you his image him, that you become what you see Oh God. So he said that we are changed. Metamorpho is the term here. We're changed. It's just like Ah, oh God, a caterpillar. Ah, oh God, he's an ugly creature that has to crawl on the ground. And he's not really pretty. Yeah. And you've been through some ugly stuff. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. You've been through some ugly stuff. You dealt with some ugly trauma. Ah, oh God, and it looked like you had to crawl everywhere in order to get where you are. But God is getting ready to give you some wings. God is getting ready to take you through. Ah, oh God, metamorpho, a chain. Yeah. Ah, God, so that when you come out, ah, God, you like a butterfly. You just happy. Yeah. And everywhere you go, hallelujah, you got something to give God glory about because you recognize that God took your shame, that God took your hurt, that God took your pain and changed it into glory. Uh, God, one scripture said that I'll take their shame and I'll give them glory for their shame. Oh, uh, God, some of us been through hell. Some of us been through hot water. But I want to say this to you now, that God is going to give you double for your trouble. That God is going to take what you've been through and get glory out of it. Somebody say, after all I've been through, yeah, yes, I've been through some stuff. Yes, I've had to cry. Yes, I've had to walk alone. Yes, I've been hurt. Yes, I've been lonely. Oh, my God, but all I've been through, I still got a praise in my mouth. Oh, God, because God is bringing about an eternal purpose in my life. So we are all changed into that same image. From glory to glory, we're changed into that image. God wants to take you to another level. Each test ought to give God more glory. Each trial, each dilemma that you deal with ought to take you to another place. You got to bear this image. 
You got to bear the image of the earthly and you have to bear the image of the spiritual, the heavenly. And so look at this. You got some work to do. Somebody say, I got some work to do. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody say it. I got some work to do. Let's look at uh, 1 John real quick, chapter 3. And I just want to share this with you because this ought to be your passion. This ought to be your desire. And look what he says in verse chapter 3 of 1 John. He says, behold, verse 1. He says, behold, what potipos, what manner of agapetos, what manner of love have the Father bestowed upon us, look, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth, world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Stop worrying about the world knowing you. Make sure that God knows you. And more than that, make sure that you know him. He says, beloved, oh God, agape toast. Now, right now, are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, what does it say? We shall be like him. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to bear his image. For we shall see him as, it is, as he is. And so now, 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 this is what's interesting. You got some work to do because sometimes we want God to do everything, but you got to do some stuff. So he says to us, verse three, and every man that has this hope, every man that wants to bear this image, every man that wants to be like him, every man that wants to see him like he is, <clears throat> he purifieth himself even as he is pure. Purify, which means to clean, to purge. You got to purge yourself. You got to cleanse yourself. Why? Because I want to see him as he is. And, and the only way I can do it, if I got this hope in him, I got to purify myself. Some things you got to kill. Some things you got to take care of. Some things you got to do. God ain't going to do it all. You know my heart, God. Yeah, you know your heart as well. You know your heart better than anyone. Now, now, now. Let me try to wrap this up. I pray that this is blessing you. I pray that this is helping you. But now let's shift gears. God has an eternal purpose in the church. Very quickly, go to the book of Ephesians. Wow, I went right there. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians, go to the book of Ephesians. Chapter number three. And I want to show you this real quickly. Just bear with me. Give me a little bit of grace. Ephesians chapter number three. God has an, a purpose in the church. He has a purpose for man. He has a purpose for you. And he has a purpose in the church. Yes, the church is the ecclesia, the ecclesia, those that are called out. But what are we called out for? We are not just called out to have chicken dinners and praise and worship and a fellowship. We are called out that we become the body of Christ and he becomes the head. And so now, 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 if we are the body of Christ and we are connected to Christ, he is the head. The church has a serious purpose. Let me share it with you real quick. I don't have time to go through all of it, but just grab this real quick. So. In Ephesians chapter number three, as a matter of fact, if I could rename Ephesians, I would rename it as the book of purpose. Because throughout every page, throughout every paragraph, God exposes to us his bulima, his intention, and what his will is. And now, 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 so look at it says, in verse number 10 of chapter three, One of the purposes of the church, verse, back, back up to verse 9, to make, make all men see what is the koinonia, the fellowship of the mystery of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Verse 10, to the intent, the purpose, to the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church 
the manifold wisdom of God. Mm, that's a heavy scripture, verse, verse 10. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So what I see is, what I see is, what I see is, is verse 10 lets me understand that God's purpose in the church is to be a vehicle that he might be able to make known through the church his manifold wisdom. So when you say his my God, when you say his manifold wisdom, this brings into play a, a, a deeper Greek term. And that term is polkolos. And, and let me say it again, or let me spell it for you. Uh, P-O-L-U, P-O-I-K-I-L-O-S. And it is polkolos. And I want you to get that. So he says, the manifold, amen, wisdom, the manifold Sophia, which means that God's wisdom through the church is not one dimensional. It's more than one dimension. In other words, God has a purpose in the church that he wants principalities and powers. He wants demons and devils to know how God, hallelujah, that he's going to use the church, how God to show his manifold wisdom. Now, when you look at manifold wisdom, it means varied wisdom. It means wisdom that is multifaceted. It means that it is not one dimensional. It is not myopic in the scope of its reach and its understanding. And so this is why we cannot get caught up in having being in a church that is one dimensional, that is not multifaceted when it comes down to the things that be of God. I want you to know that we got to be able to minister more than blessing and more than a breakthrough. We got to be able to minister the, the character. Uh, God, we got to be able to minister the essence of who God is. We got to be, we got to know and understand that the church is the vehicle that the one man is going to be made manifest in. Because even though uh, God, the church is a lot of people, it's only one body, it's only one head, it's only one man. The church is the vehicle by which God is going to project the image. The church is the vehicle by which God is going to let the one man be seen. So God is going to call all of us into that one body, which is Christ. And him being the head is going to be the man, ah, God, that lets the devil know, ah, God, that God is in authority. And this is why you ain't got to worry about whether or not the church is going to make it or whether or not the church is going to be victorious or whether or not the church uh, has the power. I heard Jesus say to Peter, uh, God, in the book of Matthew chapter 16, he told Peter that upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So is the church going to make it through Corona? Yes. Is the church going to make it through turmoil? Yes. Is the church going to make it through struggle? Is the church going to make it through the fire and through the flood. Yes, because God has declared that when we pass through it, that he will be with us because the church is a part of God's eternal purpose. God is working the purpose in us. He is gathering us together through the church to one man that Christ might be the head and that we might project that image, that econ, that replication of who God is. I love you. I pray God that your mind is running. I pray that I've said something that, that have caused you, amen, in Jesus' name, to be excited and, and to anticipate what God has for you. God has an eternal purpose in you. He has an eternal purpose in man. He has an eternal purpose in the church. And so I pray now that as, amen, in Jesus' name, we close that you would be a blessing to our church, that you would be a blessing to our ministry. See, I just, I just don't want to preach about people getting a Cadillac and a BMW and a Jaguar and a nice house. That's fine. That's dandy. That's good. Those are earthly purposes. I want you to tap into your spiritual purpose. I want you to become who God said you can be. I want you to bear the image of who God is. Be a blessing to our house. Go to Give the Five. Download the application, sow a seed, sow a $100 seed, sow a $500 seed, a $5,000 seed, whatever it is. Some of you are blessed. God has opened doors for you just that much. 
And now as he's blessed you, you ought to bless him back according to your riches and glory. As he's blessed you according to his riches and glory. Be a blessing. Go to Givify. Go to lastdayschurch.org. You can find the link there and you can give in Jesus' name and you can be a blessing. And I want to tell you, once you start tapping into eternal purposes, oh my God, your whole mindset changes. You begin to see God in a total new light. As always, myself and First Lady Bell, we love you, we miss you, and we're praying for you that you find the eternal purposes that God has in your life. We love you in Jesus' name.